Hey, this is John Bokenkamp, showrunner and co-writer of episode 601, Dr. Hans Kohler, and episode 602, The Corsican. Welcome to season six. You are listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Funny thing, I took up Tai Chi and spinach myself during the hiatus. Welcome back to the award-winning Blacklist Exposed podcast. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I am inmate Aaron Peterson, and there can only be one Blacklist Exposed podcast. Bonus points if you understood what that meant. Thanks for joining us once again as we discuss numbers 33, Dr. Hans Kohler, and number 20, The Corsican, written by John Bokenkamp and John Eisendrath, with our one directed by Bill Rowe and our two directed by Kirk Kenny. Yes, we're going to do both at the same time. This is a combination podcast, just like you watched the show. Show notes and other intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. Unless they watched Thursday night and then watched Friday night, then they didn't watch them together. But it's still two episodes before we were able to get the podcast out. Yeah, we're going to, whatever he just said. Yeah. I forgot about the Thursday thing. It it just was so long ago. (laughs) I just wanted to watch them all together. I'm a big fan. You know, if you can watch them in a block, why wouldn't you want to watch them in a block? It's a binge city in America, man, in the world. You should eat some spinach. It might actually help your brain. You know what? It has been a while since we did this. I am a rusty. Yeah. So for those that might be new to the show, we're not always like this, but welcome. We have a great kickoff in store for you this week. Just to give you a lay of the land, we always start out things with thoughts from you, the fans, with what we call our profiling question of the week segment, where we solicit answers to a lingering item from last week. Then we get into our weekly case profile where we break down the episode, the music, and each character arc. Yes, there will never be a recap ever on this podcast. We'll hear words of wisdom during Red's rhetoric where you get to vote on your favorite Red story of the week. Then we close up with special agent intel, which normally features you guys. But this week we have a special treat. John Camp is back. Well, it's finally season six, Aaron. It's good to hear you again. Hiatus must have been good to you because... You sound like a whole new man. What do you mean? Like I had a surgery? I just think we're going to keep burning that joke into the ground as long as we can this season. <laughs> it, it's always, you know what it plays. They just found out, let them, let them burn with it a few times. I get it. I get it. I think there there were what, three, two or three references this in the two hours? Yeah. Uh, I, thought, I think it kind of, did you come five? I thought you kind of five when we watched it the other day. I'll be honest, I didn't count the other day, but I'm counting now, and I'm pretty sure it was... <laughs> I'm not pretty sure. Three. Three, four, five. You got five? All right. There were several references to uh, being a different guy, new identity. I did like I did like that where he said, you know, being someone who took on a new identity and became your true self. I really like that because it made me think, hmm, maybe it's just a guy that was kind of with Katerina and he was mousy. And he ended up stepping up just to protect uh, Liz. You know, let's throw a whole other option out there. Let's get crazy. Maybe he was a guy that was pissed off that Katarina completely dissed him and went out with this other guy because he was handsome and strapping and charming. So he said, hey, I could be that guy. That's what I'm saying, Mousy. And then she got killed. He really loved her because everybody seemed to love Katarina. And I'm, according to the flashbacks, I don't blame him. I'm, I'm with him. And then maybe he just he stepped up to the plate because he saw poor Liz kill dad and, you know, anything's possible. A lot of options are open with this revelation, which we found out last week in the interview with John Camp. He went on the record 100%. This is not the Raymond Reddington of 30 years ago. Different guy. And by extension, not Liz's father. And Liz's father is indeed D-E-A-D dead, just like this Raymond Reddington told her oh so long ago. Mm-hmm. So the problem with fans is fans, because we won't let it go. <laughs> we they flat out said it in season one, and we're just like, no, got to be. A, I mean, some. I mean, everybody's in their own camp, and but we've all at some point maybe rethought it, came came back to it, hesitated, repopulated it in our mind, and it's a, it's about time we just admitted they were telling us the whole time we just weren't listening. I was. You, you were, in, in, but you also in, in, in a roundabout in a roundabout you way. Also, weren't because you hear everything and you jump to six different directions when it really, you know, somebody's like, "Hey, man, the sky is blue," and they just mean, "Wow, what a blue sky!" 
Troy jumps into all kinds of theories from that, and it spirals into some chaotic nonsense that I can't even decipher. So you do it too. Just maybe not on that aspect. And I don't think it'll stop this season either. No, I think we're going to be speculating the whole time. You know, a lot of people are talking about the mother theory, you know, Katarina. That's been a big one for the last several years. And I'm just sitting there going, well, if you want to lock up, I know the shower. So I want to see what happens. I want to see some scars. That's what you were saying. You were saying that they do a strip search in, in prison. And, and you're like, Mandatory. no, no, yep. no, no, they can't. They can't do that. Uh, the, the, the whole make a penis thing hasn't happened in, in time. And I'm like, I looked it up. 1946 was the first making a man of a man. Can I just clarify? Um, I'm the son of a, of a nurse. I would never say make a penis. I, I would never. <laughs> I said reconstructing the male organ. I didn't think was was done at that time. Apparently, it was. It doesn't make your theory more plausible. It just means science is a lot better than I thought it was. That's right. It's a lot further along. I, I assumed it was the last 20, 25 years. But. Everything that we are using today in the consumer world has been done by the government many, many moons ago. This scientific update brought to you by Troy and Aaron, because Neil deGrasse Tyson isn't allowed to anymore. Moving oh, on. Oh, too soon. <laughs> too so, soon. So, <laughs> we... We kicked off the profiling question at our season six premiere podcast, asking all of you, what do you want to see in season six? Raffaella said she wants more badass Liz. Nath says some resurrection of Basil Boz, because we don't know if he truly died. He's a true giant among men. Grace Norman said, Red and Liz having a calm and happy relationship. Cindy said, I would like to see Katarina return alive. The meeting between Liz and Katarina would be awesome, and it would be interesting to see the dynamic between Red and Katarina. Marta said, Red's true identity, the backstory on why Red took on Reddington's identity and how he became Red in the first place. And then season seven can deal with the fallout of that reveal. George said, more Dom, because usually when we see Dom, we get some kind of big reveal, not to mention how great of an actor Brian Dennehy is. I would like for Liz and Agnes to meet Dom, knowing he is their grandfather, or so he doesn't have to lie about who he is. Lorelai wants more blacklisters, of course. Continued involvement of Glenn, the reformed arsonist Fagin from The Cook. He is an interesting character and would be great to have back. Douglas wants more jelly bean. Bill wants the Cooper Reddington naval history. Deborah wants to know about Liz's scar and why Tom had it engraved on his go box. And Johnny wants to know a little bit more about Jen's growing up and why her father abandoned her in the first place. Now for our next profiling question. Do you think Jennifer survives season six? I don't know. Deep six. I mean, she is the only one left from that side of the family. <laughs> Do you, is she more expendable because you know she's definitely not related to Red? I would think so. Like, he doesn't seem to have any interest in her survival one way or the other, so she's more expendable, right? Just like Mr. Moreau in this episode in particular, he killed everybody that actually knew who he was. Technically, if I am this Raymond Reddington that we see before us today, I would kill everybody that was involved with the OG Raymond Reddington in the entire family tree so that they could not identify me. So I think she is a dead woman walking. Wow. All right. Well, see what happens with that. We're going dark out of the gate, people. I think she's going to be around for a little bit, though. She is. Let's get Aaron a drink so we can toast this explosive open to season six as we dig into this week's case profile. Okay, so we return to the blacklist with Red foiling a bank robbery in typical Red fashion, assisting the robbers in the process, all to steal a painting, which he then returns out of the good nature of his heart. Apparently, he's turning 60. He feels like doing some some good... Some good deeds. That was really sweet of him to participate in a federal crime. Then we find out that Red needs to find out. Oh, I guess I should stop there. Did Did you enjoy this opening? I mean, to kick the new season off? Yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it was very much classic Blacklist. Cold open, didn't know what was going on. What What does the bank have to do with anything? And then, oh, there's just Red standing there, like reading a newspaper. <laughs> it was really fun. <laughs> I had a lot of fun Totally out of the blue. So fun. I love the uh, the dump truck. Just dump. Are they really shooting at the cops? And they just dumps them out. That was rude. I would think that would, you know, dampen the escape plan, but seemed to work all right. 
We find out later in the episode, Red needs to, and, and if I guess Troy alluded to it, but you're new to the show, you never listened to this podcast before, we break down the story very quickly. We don't do a full recap, and then we'll get into the characters and kind of where they ended up, and that makes it, to us, a little easier to kind of break down where the show is at. We just feel it works better for, for us. Agree. So Red needs to find Dr. Hans Kohler. He's a plastic surgeon who obviously helped Red become who he is today, the man he is today. The identity he is today, the person he is today. <sighs> anything else? Did I miss any? Well, he is a man today. <laughs> I didn't mean you could go back to that. All right. <laughs> and one whom Red calls friend. Unfortunately, uh-huh. Red and friends arrive too late because Kohler, see, has been held, kidnapped, to, and, and forced. His whole team has been forced to fix this man, Bastian Moreau, played by the one and only Christopher Lambert. I always want to say Lambert, so I always like get halfway through his last name because he's kind of, I think he's a French actor, but it's spelled Lambert, Lambert, but I always say, start to say Lambert, <laughs> and then I, I, I come back to the Ert. It's At a, least it's, it's a not Lindbergh. That would be something totally different. I'm a big fan of the guy. He had a really cool movie that nobody saw called Fortress. If you can find it, go check that one out. It was a really cool uh, flick in the 80s or early 90s, one of those. Anyway. Red does make sure that his widow is taken care of, but, but the man who killed him is Bastion Moreau, and that's really where we end up flipping to the episode. But we do get to say goodbye to this guy. You know, I, I, I heard them on the floor. I didn't have closed captioning as an option. Could you tell what was said? I thought it just said Picasso. Huh. Oh, for the dog. For the dog. Okay. I well, was just making sure if that's all it was or if something else eked out there and I just missed it because I didn't have closed captioning as an option. I would assume so. that the closed captioning was on. It said whispers. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say Picasso. It just says whispers. All right. Well, Moreau had kept uh, Kohler hostage and forced him to reconstruct his face. And since Moreau is a terrorist for hire, that's not a good thing. It's very, very bad. What that does is it leads us into our second hour where Moreau heads to the UN to set off a bomb which Red assists the task force with reaching and dismantling in time. Basically, he finds the guy who made the bomb, flies him over, they they dissect and, and um, dismantle the bomb, averting a red catastrophe. I may I'm using red in every word I can find. Now there, you notice he's like dismantling the bomb, and the and the juices kind of merge together, and they're in New the York. Juices, yeah, whatever it was, the ammonium, the fluids, the, fluids, yeah. the ammonium, and the sulfur, or whatever it is, but. When the juices started to move together and they're in New York, I was like, oh, Die Hard 3. Oh. <laughs> did they ever solve that puzzle? I don't know if they ever and did. I never understood that puzzle. You know, the one where they're in the park? Yeah. I, I just, I never understood the puzzle. It never made sense to me. I've done it. Nobody understands this unless you saw Die Hard with a Vengeance, but I'm telling you, if you saw it, you know exactly what I'm talking about because it made no sense. But all is well. Despite this development, someone has tipped off local authorities to Red's position. And Red is a red stid. See, that's twice I did that. You, that? You, that one was that. No, you stretched it. Uh, too far? Too far. Stretched it. All right. He's brought in the NYPD. Red is forced to fend for himself as an ambitious DA will not let him walk despite the Fed's claims of his invaluable nature. Red is going to do hard time. How I know that is not because of where we end the episode. But because they caught the MVC promo, and it 100% confirmed, he's definitely going to be going to jail a little bit. I think you've made your point clear on the MVC <laughs> promo. <laughs> too too much? I don't know. I don't know. Hey, they, they got to sell the show. I get it. For those that are longtime listeners, we have switched places, people. <laughs> Aaron is now cursing NBC, and I am not. I'm not cursing. I just I didn't need I didn't need to see that. Thankfully, they held the big reveal of who tipped them off. That was held, so that was great. He does want to know who that rat is, though. The one who flipped on him. He wants that rat found. He wants that rat found so he can put that rat down. So he tasks Liz with finding the rat, which should be easy enough because it's her. Whoa. <gasps> what? Shocker. What just happened? That wasn't in the promo. No. That, thank the Lord. That was not in the promo. I actually, for a point, because when she's having that conversation with Russer and she's like, I know you didn't tip him off. That was my big debate. I'm like, well, it's either her or him. I don't know who else it would be. It's either her or him. I don't think Samar would do it because she's, you know, forgetting words. So I don't, I definitely thought it was, who did you think it was? Did you always think it was Liz? Seriously, for all the time you tell me that I think too deep and put too much of this and too much of that, the obvious choice was Jennifer. 
She's just yeah, tired of waiting. That's why I didn't think it, though, because it was too obvious. But sometimes it is just the obvious answer. So when it was the two I of agree. them talking, I'm like, oh, it was Jennifer. It was Jennifer. Nope, it was me. I was like, oh, didn't see that coming. I did think, Jen- I mean, obviously, when we're in the room, I'm like, oh, that's obviously Jennifer, because they were talking about the whole, keep to the plan, do the plan, don't don't change the plan. You're not moving fast enough. You stick me in a closet. <laughs> Which is weird. I mean, he obviously knows that they've met. Can he just like take? Can, couldn't they throw the folders in the closet and they were just hanging out having cappuccino or something? It wasn't at the client list that she was printing off anyway. So it's not like Red didn't. Red gave her the client list. I just didn't get that part. <laughs> I guess keep her, keep him out of, in the dark that we're working together on you. But you already know that we've met. We're sisters, so we're obviously going to be in contact. Exactly. But, but here's the biggest flaw of that whole thing. Oh boy. We, we've already known that Red just invites himself into her apartment at any time. He literally bought her furniture one season and had the apartment furnished before she got home. So why are you using your apartment as your base of operations? Get a clubhouse like Tom had in season one. Just saying. Well, I, I'm pretty sure last season they established boundaries that he wouldn't do that anymore, though. This is I true. They right. did. They did. Yeah. So I don't, I'm, they're holding to it. So Makes far. sense. So far. Okay. All right. Well, that's the the crux of the entire episode. So we had two hours. We had two episodes. How did you feel about the season premiere? And I'm gonna we're gonna call both hours the season premiere, and not just the first hour because that's how it played out on Friday night. Yeah, because they, you, they mentioned Bash and Moreau in the in the first episode. So I right. think it, it was it was intended to be seen as a two hour event, a ninety minute movie, if you will, because movies should be ninety minutes. Definitely flows through, but it also they could break them apart for syndication. So how did you feel overall of the New season. I could tell you that the first hour felt very much blacklist. It was very methodical. You know, hey, we got this case. We got to go find this thing. Red wants to also go find the thing. They meet in the middle, but really there's an altruistic motive. Here's this client list at the end. But of course, I have to get rid of myself. Very much blueprint blacklist. And because of that, I absolutely loved the first hour. The second hour... Mm, I didn't get interesting. I didn't know what to think of the second hour at first because here we got this guy we're chasing, Bastion Moreau. I kind of have it already in the back of my head. Like they're not going to catch the bad guy in the second episode of the season, especially if we're now eighteen weeks, twenty-two episodes in a row, no breaks except for maybe a little one somewhere in there. But I think that what we're going to have is is this guy, and he's going to become like the big bad of the season. So I already know where they're mm. not going to catch him. So my expectations are kind of set. Like what what's going to happen? I didn't know where it was going to go. And I think because of that, I thoroughly enjoyed the second hour as well because it was something new and something different. And I really want to hope that we get to a something different place and not much of the first episode, kind of the the methodical arc of how we write the show, basically. I, mm-hmm. I really like the second hour because it's unexpected. After six years, you kind of need something fresh to keep the listeners hooked in. Or viewers. Whatever. You know what I meant. <laughs> I think, I think you're both. trying to say we need, we need to do something fresh. So what's going to happen is... We're going to bring on somebody else. Two good new guys are going to do this, and we'll be talking to you guys at the end of the series. Yeah, yeah. Bye. <laughs> now we should just play silence and see if people still listen. What Aaron doesn't know is that someone's going to arrest him right now so he can go hang out with Red and get the intel on the inside. Troy, Red's not a real person. He's not? No. Aw. He's, <laughs> he's not. So I really enjoyed both hours. I will say the first 20 minutes of the second hour, I was very much like, what? And what I mean by what is it was, look, I I do agree. You know, Liz has this um, moment where she has a conflict and she says, you know, he's done a lot of good, which he has. But this episode was almost painting him angelic for a little bit in in terms of how far he went to do good. Well, he has a a glow about him. He is a new man. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Let Let me finish back. Over five years and two episodes, outside of this one, I could I actually tried. I couldn't think of a single completely selfless good deed he had done. By that you mean like that he didn't get something out of it in return. Exactly. Completely selfless good good deed. What about I, what about the harem when he let Emily, uh the person that used to work for him, off the hook by giving her the sum of money and said, Okay, no all you had to do was ask. See you later. That was kind of. A, uh, I mean, that's, that's a close one. That's close, I guess. But this is like blatantly, he's a he's a do gooder here. I mean, he's really using his power for good. He's going. He's getting. He's finding the guy who built the bomb. He's flying him back. He's bringing him in. 
you know, and he's making sure that that bomb gets defused before it explodes and kills a lot of people. 100% heroic, good deed. But for but for that those 20 minutes, I'm like, I don't know, man, it's a little too not red in a way. You know, I'm just being perfectly honest. It just didn't, that, I needed maybe a little something where he got something out of it. I didn't feel like he did, except I guess to foil the Corsican's plan, maybe. So there's there's that. Well, he got to go inside the UN, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah, I know, and that part was great. Don't get me wrong. Like I really enjoyed the episode. I'm not knocking that at all. I'm just saying it, it felt very unread like to me in a way. Because regardless, you, because you wanted to have that whatever the normal not, blacklist not wanted, pattern is. No, not wanted. The, the character has been established that he doesn't do much where he doesn't get anything in return, even even if it's a little bit. So that was a completely selfless act. And they're also using that as the basis to say he does good, he does good things, he helps a lot of people, da 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 even though he's a bad guy. And I'm like, yeah, but this is like the exception, really. Because usually everything is about him and him controlling the environment and his future and everything else. So it's a little bit of a, okay. I mean, I rolled with it. I, I just felt a little bit of a stretch to me. And he didn't even get his pretzel. <laughs> You're right. He didn't get his pretzel. Then you have the big reveal where he gets caught at the at the hot dog cart or the pretzel cart and he's busted and he's going to go to jail. And even though NBC is kind of ruining the promo, I still didn't know exactly how everything was going to go down and figured it maybe it would be really short-lived or it would be something I, I think I talked to, with John. I thought it was going to happen really quickly and it doesn't happen really quickly. It's definitely going to be part of the, at least the early part of the season. I was fascinated by that. That was great. Absolutely loved that because what you said earlier about doing something different, we needed something different. We need some flat, uh, not flesh, fresh blood. We need a little bit of, you know, sp- spike it a little bit, spike the punch. You know, we know the formula, spike it a little bit. Throw a little, throw a little bit of Jack Daniels in there and let's see how this party shakes up. I, I loved it. I ended up really, really digging this two hour premiere. And that added little extra spice was the, uh, the FBI prosecutor. That was uh, grilling him when she came in and took over from the New York beat cop, unfortunately. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about her in a minute. When she's, we, we're gonna she's interesting. Her. I like her. She is. And, you know, people that are hungry for power, they always are willing to do what might be seen as the wrong thing. And is that person tied into the other lady that was talking to Bastion Moreau at the start of the second hour? Because there was that lady who is a little bit like, who is she tied to? Is this a cabal resurgence? Is this another color on the map? Yeah, why do you want to go after the UN? That, that's a big question, yeah, right? Absolutely, because I don't think we got an answer to that. Okay, so let's get into the characters, and we're covering this as covering this as one long episode or a blacklist movie, if you want. And then, like Troy said, creator John Bokenkamp will meet us on the back end during Special Agent Intel to discuss some of the finer details of the episode. But first, we always love the music in the blacklist. So, what songs do we have this week, Troy? Oh, uh, we had a plethora, eight total between the two hours. So, there's no more music for the rest of the season, guys. Blew the budget. No, but our first tune of season six was Joker and the Thief by Wolf Mother. It was heard as Red and the bank robbers attempt to make their escape underground. Then we had Wide Awake by Parquet Courts is next. It was playing while Red does some Tai Chi in the yard. Not that yard. That yard comes probably in episode three or four. Then Dope Lemons, how many times plays as Red and Dembe are just about to break in to save Dr. Kohler. At the end of the first hour, as Liz and Red chat on the bench like old times, we are treated to a great tune from the Baptist Generals called Turn Unders and Overpasses. In hour two, our first song from Wire called I Am the Fly plays as Moreau delivers the package to the Turkish ambassador. Then one of my personal favorites from my old college days, spun it on the radio many a time, Super Bon Bon, Super Bon Bon from Soul Coughing. Uh, it plays as Red and Rudiger enter the United Nations. That was a stroke of genius, I might add. Really great. As Red and Dembe explore the UN building, then we hear Sean Rose, You Keep Coming Alive. And then we close out the show with Hard Times by Vision Vision as Red goes to jail and Liz shares her secret. What's the name of that one? That is called Hard Times. You might think it's right. hard times coming, but it's not hard times coming. It's just hard times. I think hard times coming. Wasn't that the justified theme? I think so. Yeah. That was a great song. Well, not that this one wasn't. Now I'm just thinking about justified's theme song. I Sorry. Know. No, it's okay. <laughs> but the reason why we share this great music is because there is a blacklist Spotify playlist. And we have a link to that on our website at theblacklistexposed.com. And then I go ahead and grab all these songs 
throw them in an Apple Music playlist as well. So depending on which service you prefer, you can get it in either place because we are special like that and help you guys out because we love the fans. So check like that out. You, I like how you emphasize I as, as like implying that I don't do anything. All right. That hurts. Not with the music side. You do, everything, you do everything else. I don't, else. Do, no, no. I don't so do anything with Apple. I do 2%. Sure. You do 98%. How's that? I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like where your head's at. Let's get to the rest of the characters we've got. Uh, and a lot of these we're going to roll through pretty quick because let's be honest, the, the biggest portions of the episode had to do with Red, what happened to him, Liz, Jennifer, and uh, a couple other things. But Dembe, he's got a lot of background action this week. But with Red incarcerated, I want to ask you, we expect a little bit more of him with boots in the ground action, so to speak, over the next couple of weeks. Like he's going to have to be Red's army outside of the prison. And, and I think this poses a really great opportunity for this character because is he going to be more of Red's army operating in the shadows, kind of being whatever he was, like Boz was potentially back when uh, Boz was still alive, rest his soul. Um, he's alive in real life, just not on the show. And <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. What, Boz is dead? What? No. Uh, in the show. Dembe, I think, would it be interesting if Dembe, kind of like Tom, was like an nah. honor... Let's not reference the Tom. Sorry. Tom is gone. He is faked his death. He is now in hiding in a hospital somewhere. The fake husband formerly known as Tom uh, Mm -hmm. was when he was part of the kind of, I think it was season three where he was kind of like part of the task force, but he really wasn't. Wouldn't it be cool to see Dembe like side by side with Aram again and doing some of that fun stuff. So I wonder if that'll be where they go with Dembe's character to get him more into the action. It would be interesting. I really want to see him running the operation and I want I want him and Smokey. I want him to get all together and Dembe is kind of like running. Like he, he was number two outside. I think he should be number one. The man of few words becomes the man of like, you go do here, you go do this, you go do that. Yeah. I think it would be great. I would love to see Dembe in that role. I would love to see Hisham play that role. I I really, I do think that could be, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I think it could be fun. It would. I agree. Or, or maybe Dembe has to have Liz run some of the operation. Mm. Huh? Mm-mm. How about that? That's an idea. You never know. Maybe Dem- somebody's got to run it. Maybe Dembe's friends with Wentworth Miller. <laughs> Maybe he's already on the inside. Guest I, appearance later this season. Yeah. If you see a guy running around with tattoos all over his body, that dude wants to break out of jail bad. Just so you know. Okay. Aram. Oh, wait. That doesn't make any sense because I think a lot of people in jail probably have tattoos all over their body. You know what? Strike that. It was a TV show. What do I know? It Aram. Good, it was a good TV show. I love that TV show. I even love the last season. Actually, all of the seasons. I love them all. Even when they killed him and didn't kill him. <laughs> and for those that don't know, the show is called Prison Break, <laughs> just in case. Yeah, in case you want to go watch it. It's a fun show. Yeah. Uh, Aram does his tech guy thing, but mostly he's worried about his fiance and her uh, status. I don't know. Is, that, is, really... that, is that the Facebook status? Did she change it to in a relationship yet? <laughs> yeah, I wonder if, if that's what it was. I don't think outside of concern for his fellow humans like Samar and, and Red, I don't think Ram really did a whole lot this these two hours. Do you? Uh, he, had the, he had big? the one. Yeah, he had the one really good scene where he was like, hey, uh, yeah, no, he got arrested. And then Rester's was like, oh, that's so great. Yeah, that's awesome. He's like, no, oh, no, yeah, no, no, Red. Yeah. Red was arrested. Oh, crap. So really not a whole lot else, right? You would agree? Not in this one in particular, no. Not in this one, yeah. Because Samar just kind of came back from the hospital and went right out in the field, so we didn't get any uh, office romance lookies at each other, which was, I thought was interesting because we last left with this big proposal, and then here they didn't really even interact for two hours. Well, it sounds like they're already married. Okay, so moving on to Samar. <laughs> <laughs> moving on to Samar. She's released and back to duty. But when the nurse asked her if there was anything else she needed to know, Samar hesitated, or like any words she couldn't remember, I think it was the line, she hesitated. Anything there, you think? Did you pick up? Is that, Are you saying that's what you picked up on? Because that's what I picked up on. Yeah, that's what I picked up on. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I know you're saying, oh, you try to overreact and look at stuff. Maybe she's just fine and just was tired. Well, since I thought that same thing, I would say that that was there. Oh, so when I, you okay. say it's okay, it's fine. But when I say something, you're like, oh, Troy, you're just dumb. No, I see how when you when you see a guy that's taking out the garbage behind everybody else in the scene, and you say that guy's working for Red, that's probably going too far. That guy is working for Red. Don't you remember? <laughs> Red said, "I got eyes all over the city." That's the guy yeah. that's working for Red. I'm telling you. All right, Samar, back to Samar. 
yes, I think there is something more to that story. I think there might be just a little bit off in her mind, but she doesn't want to share because being part of the team, doing her duty, being in the action is what she lives for. And she came back from dead, basically. So mm-hmm. this way, now this is what she lives for. So she can't sit in that hospital any longer. But I think that might be to her detriment at some point. Not I, death necessarily, but yeah, could incapacitate. So yeah, I inca- uh, can't say that word. Incapacitate her in some way. What would be really funny? Not funny, awful, but funny. If she can't remember certain words, and then Aram goes up to her like, "Hey, remember that marriage we talked about?" And she's like, "Oh, what a great way to get out of it." <laughs> just like I'm sorry I was concussed I don't remember anything I don't think I said that I'm gonna need some time and then, she, go, have and then she goes and people. puts her arm around wrestler instead oh that's cold-blooded man that's cold-blooded but a great segue wrestler back to being Mulder and Skelly with, with he and Liz they're they're on the ground taking on cases like, looking great together love to see that it was really fun hairs on point it's all good always he he's the only one not really broken up about Red's arrest, though. I do want to point that out. Like, he's good with it. He's fine. Well, he's the guy. He's the one that's the most interesting character, I think, this season of where it could go. Because he's the guy that's been following this Raymond Reddington for the last, I guess it'd be like 10 years now. <laughs> I don't know how mm-hmm. far we are in the show. Five years before the show started and then wherever we're at today because of the time jump and all that other fun. Oh, yeah. Gymnastics. I forgot the time jump. Yeah. One, yeah. A year and a half. Yeah. So. I, I think what he knows and what he could bring to the table through this, whatever you want to call it, investigation or keep my distance because we can't say that we actually know Reddington because he's not really working with the FBI, et cetera. I, I think wrestler and Liz's dynamic throughout the course of the season, it'll be interesting to see if Liz leans on him first to divulge what she knows. Hmm. You think so? Well, if if I'm trying to get answers or why the heck this guy took over my dad's identity, I would go to the first person that knows the most about him and the most the person that knows the most about him that's alive and accessible is wrestler. Right. Interesting. I, I would be interesting to see where this goes. I want to know because red has some skin in the game, right? I, I think John talks about that a little bit later on, but what I really want to know is wrestler also should be concerned because Red does have dirt on him. Sure, sure. I mean, he, he does have dirt on everybody, really, in the federal government. He could really pick one of them to drop dime on to get leverage so that he could maybe get out of, the, you know, he could pull a kingpin or something. Where he gets leverage to get out of prison and transported somewhere and that's where they break him out or something. So he could use some of his leverage on any of them. He has leverage on all of them. Oh, that'd be a great one to do on wrestler because of the the good Boy Scout concept for that. Yeah, the and, murder. I mean, he killed the um, uh, Hitchens. Yeah, killed Hitchens. Yeah. Ah, could could I'm just saying that there's options there. Good storylines. Good storylines. Hmm. Good good opportunities. We don't know where they're going to go. But no, no, it's no, a no. good opportunity. All right, then we come to Cooper. He goes to bat for Red and the task force, which I was really impressed with. I mean, what I get, I mean, it's his job. You know, he wants to pay bills. He's got to pay for. Probably, um, what's her name's, what was her name? His wife. Uh, oh man. Brain fart. Charlene. Charlene. That's what it was. Charlene. Yeah. For, for Charlene, you know, he needs the money to pay for Charlene because we don't know where she is and I'm sure there might be an Allen money payment or something. And also, you know, because he cares about his coworkers, he cares about the good they've done. He wants that to continue. And am I mistaken or did he disobey Panna Baker's order to stand out and goes to the DA? He, because she flat out told him, "Don't do that." Correct. Correct. And then he yeah. brings her in on this, shows her everything Red is doing, and she doesn't that really kind of put her at risk? Because remember, Liz earlier in the episode said, "Don't bring anybody in on anything," because those people always end up dead. Essentially, that puts the DA at risk now. Agreed or no? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think that is absolutely true. I mean, it just, it's a twofold. It gives her leverage over Cooper in the task force in a way. Mm-hmm. She can she can use that to extort information or whatever. I don't know how they can use it, but there's, I'm sure there's ways. As well as it puts her in danger because she knows more than she should know. And once Fred knows that she knows that, she becomes expendable, I think, to a degree. Because he can't, he can't have his cover blown. Right, right, right. Oh, I like where I like where your head's at. I think that's a really good kind of train of thought in order to put that together. 
Mm. Now, what did you think about the DA? Because Cooper didn't really do a whole lot else um, in this episode outside of that, but that, that was a lot. But where, where do you stand on the DA? Because I know you found her a fascinating character. Why is that? Uh, she reminds me a little bit of Julian from season four, where she's like that tough, hard nose, won't back down kind of thing. And mm-hmm. I think that there are people in the government that should call this task force into question. Not that there is a task force to call into question. Because obviously it seems like she knows that the task force does exist the way she was talking. I, I really couldn't put a finger on if she does know or doesn't know. Because she was kind of like, if this thing existed, and she's kind of talking in hyperbole. But the, the way she just stood up to Cooper and said, yeah, no, that's not happening. I'm like, dang. Like, no one stood up to Cooper before. Now we got Cooper versus the DA. That's going to be an interesting storyline this season, too. Yeah, that's one. I don't even want to speculate because it could go so many different ways. So I'm just going to hold off. I don't really know where it's going to go, but I kind of, kind of gave you where I'm thinking, I guess. And if you go to and if you go back to season three with the end of the director, there are other colors on that map. So there could be other factions, and this might be a new faction that we're seeing as we move forward into season six. Now, Jennifer, okay, here's what happened with her. She's helping Liz. They find the burned down building from Liz's childhood. Troy, what did you, and obviously we know that she was in on Red going to jail. What did you discern from this discussion with the sheriff? You had an issue with the sheriff. The sheriff is your new best friend. You just love this guy. You're all about this guy. He's in this show for 30 seconds. Troy's all about him. He wants a uh, dossier. He wants a profile. He's basically sent out a PI to find out where this guy lives. Tell us about the sheriff. Well, this is this is my brain and how it works. So we're watching this thing, and like, here's this sheriff in this small beach town in the front of this house. He's the only person that's left that remembers what happened that night as they're having this conversation. Oh, yeah, I remember the guy. He was a nice guy and whatever. And yeah, we had like drinks at the bar and stuff. <laughs> he's Jimmy Stewart all of a sudden. Exactly. Hey, sweetie. So if Wait, he's that's the, more Humphrey Bogart, I'm sorry, I just blew that completely. Well, it, 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 it looks like the whole show and this whole concept of he's the last man that knows his face and he kills everybody, so nobody knows who he is. If this is the last guy that really knows anything about the events of the fire in that night and the OG Raymond Reddington, then the way Red would operate would lead me to believe that he would have somehow influenced the sheriff at some point. And the reason why I say that is like the next scene, they're going over to where Moreau is now killed. Kohler, he's laying on the ground. They're standing over him and Red and Liz have this fantastic back and forth about tell me your secrets and I'll tell you mine. And the way Red looks at her says like he knows something that she's been up to, but we're not going to know what he knows. And then the first thing that went into my mind was like, dude, sheriff's on his payroll. Sheriff said, hey, these two girls came looking at this house and told Red and that's kind of like where my brain goes. And that's why I'm like fixated on the sheriff. But apparently you and some other people tell me I'm completely off my rocker. Yeah, I think it's bit. plausible. I don't think he's probably just a sheriff. He's just probably a nice guy in a small town. But to me, as I'm watching the show, that's where my head is going. Yes, that maybe Red does know something. And he's kind of put some pieces together because he has eyes everywhere. And he probably is an alien. He might be. Mm-hmm. He's one of the men in black guys. <laughs> <laughs> he's walking around. He's got the little, uh, bzz, what was it? The memory, uh, well, what was it? I don't even remember what that was called, but anyway. Yeah, the memory. All right. Well, Thank he, you. Well, he, well, he did find the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the client list on Orion's belt or Picasso's see? belt. Yeah. <laughs> Picasso's <see>? belt. <laughs> are you, are you glad Jennifer's joining the Scooby gang? Cause I think you and I differ currently. I think for at least right, as of now. I mean, for right now, I think it's fine. I think she could become more of the MacGuffin. Um, I already heard somebody say that she's the Agnes of season six already. I don't know if it's that awful at what? this point. Ex- yet. Explain that to me, though, because I she didn't have much screen time. She did nothing wrong. I just don't understand why that is a something someone said. I, we've gotten to know these characters for so many years, and now this new person just kind of inserts herself into the family. It's kind of like, oh, that's that's that new person. Yeah, that's that new person. That's that you know f- new friend in the friend group. We don't want to talk to that person. You know, you I, don't want that new friend smell. Exactly. <laughs> I, I I really think that's that's kind of how people, the fans, may be reacting to her initially, and because she's very much the you know, oh hey, I already did this. You know, Liz, why didn't you do this? You're the FBI person. I already went and found this thing. I already tracked down the newspaper clipping. I already did. I already did. I already did. So it's kind of like she's trying to one-up Liz, and I think people are like, dude, back off. 
I like her. I've, I'm really enjoying what she's doing. She's a little bit more manic than Liz. Kind of reminds me of where Liz was like a few years back, and I, I like it. I feel bad because she's really expendable. I mean, she could she could bite a bullet any episode. But I like her as a character. I, I really like the dynamic. I like the idea that Liz has a sister. She's trying to protect her. I, I'm looking forward to where the character goes. I think it's a little too premature to compare to Agnes. My God. <laughs> I already like her more than Tom. I do yeah, like I said her. it. <laughs> I do like that you were going to say that because I'm like, <laughs> I, 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 in the back of my head, I'm just like the whole episode. It's like, oh, this is a Tom replacement. And Aaron's going to like this Tom. I like this Tom better. Much better Tom. <laughs> is that like a moment of silence for Tom? I don't know. All right. We're well, still talking about him. <laughs> we will see what happens. With 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 Jennifer, I, I kind of I really do like the sister bonding thing. I think that could be really interesting. She's going to get herself in some trouble, I'm sure, because that's what happens with characters like this. You know what it is? You know what it is that bothers me? It's huh. the fact that she's bonded with wrestler back in season one. Like they had this moment and everybody was like, maybe they're going to get together. You know, boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe they're brother and sister or some secret thing because of the photograph by the swing set. And it was all that speculation back in season one. I think mm-hmm. if she's going to confide in somebody in a post Tom era, it would be in wrestler. And I think because now that Jennifer's here, it takes away from the potential of her confiding in wrestler again. And I think that's where I'm probably more angsty about it because I want to see her confide in wrestler specifically. But to be fair, Jennifer exploded on the scene as in the way that they understand it as their, as her sister, why would she not be part of this? And she obviously wants to know more about red. So all of this makes sense why she would be involved, why she would be active. The character has not done anything against the way I would expect her to do it so far. To me. I mean, like, I haven't seen anything that deterred me from, like, Tom did all kinds of stuff that didn't make any sense to me. So far, Jennifer hasn't done that. Yeah, I mean, I'm jury's still out, is what I'm going to say. I like, yeah. I like the dynamic. I like the character. I know why she's there. I'm just like, man, it's going to take away from Liz and Ressler time. We could bring Agnes back. No, thank you. I wonder if uh, Carl from The Walking Dead's watching her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on but, to. But we do need Mr. Solomon back at some point. He's oh still, man, he's still out please. there live and kicking. So yeah, if he's alive, just bring him back for the hell of it. That and, is one of the most fun bad guys. And we already had show. one shady government organization that hired him, so maybe this new shady government organization can hire him. I love it. Let's do it. All right, Liz. She and her sisters are the rats. We found that out. They set Red up to get him off the streets, so to speak, so they can find out what is Red's real game. What do you think about this plan? This plan that we have to get him off the street, put him in prison so we can find out the reality. Is this a good plan? A solid plan? Does it make sense to you? I think this is one of those that if I was in the Samar camp, that this was Liz being selfish again. I like the idea that she has to put Red away in order to keep him out of her business so she can do the investigation with Jennifer that she needs to do in a more freely movable way. At the same time, it puts the entire task force at jeopardy. These are her mm-hmm. coworkers that she's suffered, you know, but you know, life, death, life again. And <laughs> she's literally sat there and said, Hey, I'm going to go to war with you people. And now they're all out of jobs in, in a way because they can't have a task force. If Reddington's not a part of it. Yeah. That was the first thing I thought I was like, eh. but she she does have that moment where she's debating it, and you, you can tell. Like, it's a real debate. But I, I get where she's coming from. She will not f- get any headway with Red so close because he won't let her be. I actually thought it was a pretty clever plan. Bold, risky, and I do, I love, not just like, and I, I don't like to overuse the word love, but I love that... Liz acknowledged we can't bring anyone else. Because this is like a TV thing that drives me nuts. <laughs> Anytime you bring somebody in on the secret, you know that person's going to die unless they're a major character because they know the secret, right? That's just the way that, thank God, she said it in this episode. Like, no, we can't bring nobody else in. They'll die. Can't do it. They'll die. He'll find out. Guaranteed. They'll die. Thank God. Because I needed that acknowledged because that's one of those TV things that always just makes me roll my eyes when let's bring so-and-so in. You know, they're, <laughs> they'll be fine. They can help us out. Well, every time we bring one somebody in, they kind of die. All right. Somebody said it out loud. I'm good. I like this plan. 
I'm a good, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan because it just Brett already has these really fun stories and things that he does on the outside. Imagine what he could do on the inside. <laughs> yeah, that should be fun. He's going to be like the Punisher in there. Exactly. But he's going to be more of like playing a chess game version right. of a punishment. Red offers Liz a quid pro quo. You tell me your secrets and I'll tell you mine. This is probably, I, th- I think, a lot of people's favorite moment of the episode because we're just waiting for either one of them to budge. What I would say, and I would argue this, she doesn't owe him Jack. She doesn't owe him any secrets. If anyone should go first, it's definitely Red. 100% should be Red. I'm completely fine with her flipping on Red, even if she's having second thoughts, and I'm completely fine with her not giving any secrets first, because that should be... And I know Red was using that to play to see if she had any secrets, but still... I can't believe his, his sincerity because he should go first. I disagree. But I, I did love them. You disagree. Why? Disagree. Because Red's already gone first. I am not your father. Your <laughs> father. Your father's dead. You shot your father. I had your. I had your memories wiped so that you wouldn't have to live through that pain. Your mother did this. Like he gave her like the whole backstory, and it's all true, except for maybe the walked in the ocean and died because then he switched his story and said walked in the ocean and the body was never found. But yeah. the. I think that he's been giving her pieces. I mean, even last year when she shoved him up against the wall uh, into that, that library, he even gave a little piece there as well. Like I can't tell this is a secret. I can't tell you because I'm protecting you, but it is something. And I'm letting you know that this is something. So that's even, even that is giving her something, giving her some answer, even though it's not really an answer. So he's been giving the, a lot of time. So I think she does have to go first, man. You're drunk. You are drunk. You're, you are, you are, uh, you're mad. Mad or drunk. I don't know which one it is, but you are definitely one of those two things. You're monk. <laughs> I, I don't know. She should, she has earned the right to hear the whole story by now. She's got, her life's gone through hell, lost her husband, barely sees her own kid, which I'm totally fine with. If you're listening, screenwriters, I'm, I'm cool with it. But she's, she's given up a lot of her life. She deserves to hear why. Why has all this tragedy happened to her? Because life was going good for a long time, she thought. Well, she had the chance to ask all the people that she needed to ask, and they're all dead now, except for one, Dembe, who's not in jail. Mm-hmm. Eh, he ain't going to say nothing, although he should. I would, that would really be cool if in, at the end the final episode, Red's still not going to say anything, and Dembe's just like, all right, hold up. Here's exactly what happened. And then he just runs through it like Clue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I don't, I don't want to see he's Red, Tim Curry all of a sudden. I don't want to see Red die, but what if Red dies or at some like funeral and then like Dembe, like the, the whole thing, like the man who never speaks, he just goes on for like five minute eulogy about the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Just, just crazy exposition. Totally. I mean, that's just it. It's just him telling the whole story. We get some flashbacks and then, you know, yeah, yeah. that would be, that would really piss everyone off in the world, but it's still funny to It'd think be about. so funny. All right, last character, and then we're going to get to John Boca Camp here in a minute. Red, of course, Red, lives his dream to give a great UN speech about Cary Grant. That was pretty funny. And some drugs. But, yeah, some <laughs> drugs and a penis shooting up upward. That was weird. That was, that was very odd. But fails to save his friend and ends up in the clink. This is a huge development for a guy who has avoided any jail time for his career. How do you think Red is ultimately going to handle prison? Uh, With a smile on his face. (laughs) I think he's going to be more pissed off about the outside than he is about the inside. He's like, where is the rat that put me in here? What is happening to my empire? What is happening to my money? Who is doing what with what? I think he's going to be more worried about the outside than the inside, which will then lead to some really interesting stories on the inside, potentially. I was thinking about this when the episode was over, about if I like this angle... Which is which is kind of funny because I think Arrow's doing the same thing <laughs> where the hero is is you know anti hero whatever is ending up in in prison for a big portion, just coincidence. That's all it is. But I, I was thinking about if this was going a different direction and we were doing a, a thing similar to what we have done in Blacklist years past, where we're still doing the Blackest of the Week, but we've got a big bad out there that we're chasing. Would would I prefer that or do I like this? And I got to say, I I really got excited about the concept of seeing Red navigate throughout the prison system because he doesn't have access to all the easy solutions that he has on the outside. What I don't want to see 
I don't think anyway. Is Liz showing up every week, picking up a telephone, going, "Hey, give me the, give me the, give me the dirt <laughs> through the glass." Yeah, I wonder it, would that work? I mean, you could, you could theoretically still be doing that to keep the task force at play. You could get kind of old after a while. Hmm. From a TV perspective. Maybe, but the government, you know, federal government, doesn't it super, uh, I guess it can't supersede. All right. When she's talking, to, she's talking to Jennifer in the apartment, the phone rings, and the, you have a collect call from <laughs> the Virginia Correctional Institute. Who this? Oh, uh, this is Liz. You sound a lot like Jennifer. No, totally different lady. Totally different. All right. So, yeah, I think that could be fun. Like, I'm really looking forward to it. I really want a prison fight where Red just navigates and doesn't touch a, touch a soul. Like he just manipulates a huge prison fight for the hell of it. Except this time he doesn't have a gun like he did on that other prison that was out in the middle of the ocean. I think this could be great. I think it could be a lot of fun. So how long is this a dynamic you would want to play out? Because you already talked about you don't want them on the phone every week. What 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 kind of let's put some numbers on it. What are you what are you giving this? Three episodes, six, eight, half a season? What are you thinking? I think it'd be the standard eight episode arc. After eight episodes, he's gotta be out of jail. It's like when they were on the run in season three. Like being on the run is fun, but being on the run and then the task force doesn't really do anything, so then it's just like extra characters on the show. Everybody mm-hmm. has to be involved doing something for the blacklist to work fully. I wonder if the task force is going to try to spring them at some point. I would love to see a Dembe Aram wrestler break right out of jail episode. That would be totally uh, boss. Like Aram shows up with sc- some schematics and Dembe and wrestler are the muscle. I could, I could see that. No, remember Dembe is the one that's putting it together with Smokey. He's like, he's barking out the orders. <laughs> I really like that. I, I could, I would actually watch that. That'd be it's fun. Like, it's, it's like, it, it, it would, it'd be a, like a heist episode for you. It's an ocean's 11 kind of thing. Okay, one of my last questions. Do you think Red would kill either Liz or Jennifer once he finds out they betrayed him? Because as Liz said, he will find out. I guess it depends on where you land on who is this Raymond Reddington. Is he uncle, twin, brother, mother, second cousin, twice removed? I don't know. Because we saw that he would definitely kill Kaplan, his right-hand man, shot her in the face. So I would not put it past him to shoot Liz if he truly is a ghost. No familial relation whatsoever. If there's the familiar relation there, that's where I think it gets a little bit squirrely. Jennifer, Jennifer will get put in the ground in a heart. Boom, done. <laughs> Doesn't care. Before she start, before she finishes her reasoning for why she's been doing it, you killed my dad. Killed and then a. <laughs> oh, well, that was that escalated quickly. Yeah, it'd be something like my mom's dead, my dad's dead, and, and now you are too. <laughs> oh, ouch, man. Yeah, I'm with you. Obviously, he won't kill Liz. Kind I would. Of. I would not say never. Like that would be an interesting twist. Like the whole time you think there's like killing this- Liz Keen. Yeah, it would be. It wouldn't. It? it would be like the last episode of the show. I think. Right. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Depend again. It depends on what what question we're asking. It, yeah, it depends on ultimately what is she uh, means to an end. Every time through this course of this journey, whenever he gets what he needs whatever that is, either they get paid off to go somewhere and hide or they end up dead. So if he gets what he needs from Liz, which we don't know what that might be, who's to say that he he wouldn't just take care of her because she knows too much Hmm. because we don't know who this imposter is. That's the big question for season six. Who is this Raymond Reddington? Who is the person that went through all this trouble to become this other man? Who does number two work for? Right. That's what Demby thinks every day. <laughs> Even though he knows. If he dropped any Austin Powers quote, my life would be complete. I'm not going to lie. It'd be complete. Now I got to watch, watch Austin Powers. All right. So overall, what do you think about our kickoff to season six? You good? You feeling, you feeling good about new episodes coming up before we get to John? Yeah. And Red's rhetoric? Yeah. I love it. I think it was really well done. Premiere. A long time coming because we got pushed to the winter. I'm more excited to see how this progresses with the whole no breaks, 18 weeks till May, a lot of story to tell. And it's like, it's like 24 days all over again where you just like popcorn and go, 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 go. Can't wait. (laughs) 
All right. Well, we have a lot more coming up. We've got John Bokenkamp, show creator, who's going to talk a lot about what several of the things that happen in the premiere mean, and especially for the show going forward. And he's got some some pretty interesting insights. I think you guys are really going to enjoy. And we're on the sixth season here at the Blacklist Exposed. So if you guys want to, we have an opportunity finally for you to contribute to the show. That's right. If you've had any fun, any experience whatsoever listening to Aaron and myself, we would really appreciate it if you would hashtag fill the fedora. That's right. Fill the fedora. It's right there on the website at theblacklistexposed.com. Just click on the hat and then go ahead and throw us a couple bucks and that would help you know do some things here because as seasons progress on TV, the costs go up. We had to kill the apps. We had to get rid of the apps because we needed some funds. So if you want to see the apps back, throw in a couple bucks in the hat and that would be fantastic. Again, theblacklistexposed.com and click on the hat, fill the fedora and throw a couple bucks our way. We'd appreciate it. All right. We'll be right back with Red's Rhetoric right after this. Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm Ruthie. And we host the Star Trek Discovery Podcast, part of the Golden Spiral Media Network. Every week, we break down each new episode of Star Trek Discovery, a brand new series in the Star Trek franchise, available on CBS All Access in the U.S., Space in Canada, and Netflix everywhere else. We analyze what happened, what we think will happen, and how the show fits and doesn't fit into Star Trek canon. And go through listener feedback. You can find us at Star Trek Discovery Podcast.com and subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice. And join our community. Our Facebook group is at Facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek Discovery Podcast. Live, Live long, long and, and prosper. prosper. Hey, Dembe Loyals, this is Hisham Taufik. You are listening to Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Welcome to Red's Rhetoric, that part of the show where we play two scenes from this week's episode of The Blacklist, and then you get to vote which one is your favorite on our poll on our website. That is theblacklistexposed.com. This week's first clip comes when he talks with Liz about classifying information. Our professional relationship is symbiotic. I help you, you help me. And our personal relationship? I don't have an alternate agenda. I have secrets, like the skeleton. I thought you'd come to terms with that. I have. Which is why I'm not upset at finding you here. It's still hard. You're my father. I want us to have an honest relationship. One has nothing to do with the other. Being honest means one doesn't lie, deceive, or cheat. Where you are concerned, I don't. How can you say that when you keep things from me? Dembe keeps things from me. That's different. So one can keep certain things secret and be in an honest relationship? The last thing I want is to push you away. So if we need a little truth and reconciliation to prevent that, well, what the hell? Just don't get greedy. You're serious. You want to know my secrets? Why I'm here? What the good doctor told me? Yes, I do. Then I'll tell you. As soon as you tell me. Tell you what? The secrets you keep from me. I never said I kept any. Studies show that at any given moment, the average person is keeping 13 secrets. So, come on. I actually think this could be quite fun. I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. This isn't a game. It could be. If the secrets you keep are as loving as the ones Dembe keeps. Our second comes when Red addresses the UN. Mr. Secretary General, Mr. President, and distinguished members of the General Assembly. Today, I want to bring to your attention a topic of great interest to me, and I believe to anyone who cares about this revered institution, Cary Grant, or specifically his acid trips, Through five marriages, numerous lovers, allegedly both male and female, and over 70 films, including North by Northwest, arguably the greatest work ever produced here, he just kept right on tripping. And why not? Before LSD was weighed down by the countercultural baggage of Timothy Leary turning on, tuning in, and dropping out, LSD was used to treat addiction, anxiety, and depression. Standing here in the heart 
of an institution dedicated to diplomacy, I can say from personal experience, LSD has made me significantly more enlightened, kind, considerate, and loving. And if people are more kind and loving, then the world will be too. There'll be less crime, fewer acts of terror, more joy, more diplomacy, and far more fun. Harry Grant once said, after a particularly evocative LSD trip, I imagined myself as a giant penis launching off from Earth like a spaceship. Did you know that Cary Grant's original name was Archibald Leach? That he was born into poverty, the son of an alcoholic father and a depressed mother, and then reinvented himself as the paragon of wasp virtue and charm. Good for you, Archie. I'm a great fan of reinvention. If you agree that withholding information is still being honest, vote hashtag Red Secrets. Or if you are a fan of Cary Grant, like Red is, vote hashtag Red LSD. Okay, now it is time for what you guys have been waiting for. This week, we have very special intel as John Bokenkamp is back with us to discuss this two-part kickoff. I got to ask you, uh, big big balls dropped here. Um, you've got Red in jail. You've got Liz owning up to it. You have this weird sheriff guy who Troy is convinced is working for, for Red. What caused you to decide, to decide to go to this direction? What did this mean to you guys, doing it this way? Well, I mean, look, the, the, the biggest thing is sort of Liz's choice, right? The big reveal at the end of our second episode is... Not really even that Red is in prison, which might have come out in in press, but the idea mm-hmm. that Liz is the one who turned him in and um, that she and Jennifer were behind his arrest. And this is a choice that she has made to park him and and, and try to stay a step ahead. And she knows that Reddington has, has ways. He has people. He gets information. She's got to stay a step ahead. And so to, to push the mystery forward, to drill down on the truth about who Reddington really is, who this imposter is, why he chose her, it, it felt like a, a powerful and smart thing for her to do. You know, rather than him randomly being uh, arrested. And I think th- the truth of the matter is without without uh, spoiling anything, you got to know it won't be too long before Red suspects that he was tipped off, right? That somebody, somebody, it might even be, if, if I'm not remembering, it's been a while, in, that, in, in our second episode, that he's got to find the person who did this. You know, he's got to find the person who did this. And that puts them on, uh, uh, you know, sort of an interesting collision course, I think. So we just felt it was a great uh, story to... to um, you know, put Liz in the driver's seat. And again, to put Red behind bars where he's never been, it's hard to find territory that are, that are firsts for a character, you know, six seasons in, we're still, we're, and, and yet we're still finding a new, you know, new territory. We've never seen Raymond Reddington in prison, and the way he navigates his arrest and being incarcerated, I think, is going to be really cool. Which it opens up a whole other world of possibilities, because you have Liz, who now wants to go out and find this backstory of what it, what happened to the OG Raymond Reddington with her sister, but where are the mm-hmm. eyes? Where are the spies that are out there that Raymond Reddington might have trying to keep tabs on her as she does this stuff? You get a whole new network of how does Red operate. I think that's a, the more interesting story is they have this really great back and forth between Liz and Red. Like, I'll tell you my secret if you tell me your secret. And you start to think that's like fun. maybe Red already knows that, right? He already knows that. Uh, so that's why this the sheriff. Yeah, you have to wonder how much he knows. Now, wait, the sheriff. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Well, yeah, the the, the sheriff that was there in uh, wherever it was Dover the, at the house that burnt down uh, through the fire uh, by the beach. Uh, uh, the, the sheriff was just a little shady to me. Like, like maybe this guy was in on it the whole time, and he's reporting back because then uh, Red's uh, all. I thought he was great. Troy's paranoid. You can just tell him it's okay. Uh, you might be a little paranoid, Troy. Uh, <laughs> you know. I do have an insane asylum named after me, so I mean, that, that's possible. Oh, boy. Well, that is true. I think you earned that. Um, I think, no, I, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, look, the, the, the bottom line is, what are his resources? What kind of respect does he garner in prison? How does he get respect in prison? You know, like, 
if, if you're if you're in um, this facility where he's being held, what do those people think? This is yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a big guy on the outside, but you don't have anybody protecting you now. I just think the idea of somebody navigating that system, let alone it being Reddington, is is uh, a, a good is a good story engine. So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a cool area for us to explore. My favorite part of the episode was the conflict that Liz had about turning right in. I thought that that felt genuine and that felt honest. And if you've been with this guy for five years, even if you know he's diabolical, you see him do good, you see him save lives, you see all this positivity. I got why she would be conflicted and why it wouldn't come to her until she'd already decided to do this thing to him. I, I love that aspect. and I, I, Yeah, I do too. And I, I don't think that she could... As, as 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 much as Reddington has done so many wonderful things for her and protected her and and, and we've had these incredibly intimate uh, moments, I don't think that somebody who has gone through what she has gone through, you know, um, him showing up in her life, withholding, you know, sort of partial truths, her husband dying, her daughter being sent away because she's she she's you know uh, fearful. I think it would be very difficult for her to say, you know what? We need to have a chit chat about the bones. I know the truth. I know they're not, they're the bones of Raymond Reddy. Now what's going on? Like, I just don't think, I don't think she could handle it in that way. I think that would be naive of her to do, to think that he would offer up and and just sort of say, well, yeah, let me tell you kind of what's going on. Sorry about this whole bones thing. So (laughs) I think she had to approach it in a way where she's proactive. She's suspect of him. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, he's as, as much as we love him as uh, the, uh, you know, sort of the central character of, of the show, he's a bad guy who murders people, you know? I mean, he's a horrible, horrible person. He's also a very loving person, but he's got a weird moral compass of his own that it's easy to forget that he is a bad guy. Which I think is one of my favorite parts of this two-parter was you you teased it on the uh, kickoff podcast was that we were going to see wrestler and Liz kind of working back together. So it was nice to see them on that kind of first case in the first episode, kind of side by side once Mm. again, but they have this kind of real, real deep argument about what is Reddington and why should we be sad? And here's this guy shot up in the trunk uh, of the car. I think seeing that dynamic and that energy between the two of them, it was really interesting to see how that played off already right at the start of the season. Yeah, well, the the thing I like about Wrestler is he still he has he as much as the Boy Scout as he is, as much as he wants to do right and has crossed over at times, uh, you know, and has Reddington's blood pumping through his veins. He he is suspicious of the guy. He's pissed at the guy. He doesn't like that he you know he murdered a fed you know he murdered a, a, a whatever a, a captive you know somebody who a uh, suspect in in FBI custody. He he doesn't like the way Reddington bends the rules and he doesn't like that. He's not being played fair with, and he doesn't like that Liz is not being played fair, played with fairly. And I, I that's something I, I just, I respect him. I respect the character. You know, I, I, I like the way that, you know, in, in a way he's, he's got so much of the same ambition that he had in the beginning. You know, he was the guy who said, Raymond Reddington, I've been hunting this guy forever. He's a bad guy. And here we are, you know, six seasons later, he was right. You know, who is mm-hmm. this guy? Um, and, and by the way, he's got a, he's got a, a unique perspective on having skin in the game because he's been hunting the guy for God knows how long he was hunting the wrong guy. Right. Like when, when, yeah. when, when yeah. wrestler finds out, you know, what, what's going on, you know, when wrestler is sort of, um, uh, but, but when, you know, the task force isn't aware of what's going on at this point. It's only Liz and it is kept secret. But imagine if wrestler finds out what's going on, that he has been, you know, hunting the wrong guy. It's, it's, uh, it's just, again, it's just this, this, this sort of enigma of Reddington expands and becomes only more frustrating and infuriating and, and makes you want to dig your heels in more to sort of unlock the, the truth. So who gets credit for the uh, Cary Grant speech? Because that was brilliant in my regard. I just I laughed the whole time that was going. That was so good. Here's the story behind that: is um, the 
the UN had reached out to us. Uh, Megan has been very involved in sort of social, humanitarian, environmental causes. And the, the UN had reached out uh, and said, look, we do, they, they shoot TV shows here and movies. And um, then they have obviously great causes that they, they want to uh, platform. And so we uh, went down the road with them a long ways in terms of, we thought we had the UN. They're like, let's go come shoot an episode at, the UN. And we thought, whoa, how cool, you know? And so we had crafted a story in such a way that we knew that the, um, the UN was going to be a target. And uh, for a number of reasons, most likely uh, because of some of the things that Raymond Reddington said about the UN, uh, it didn't work out. And um, we were left at the last minute sort of going, how are we going to play this? We are now not shooting at the UN. I thought production did a great job uh, between sort of practical locations and, um, and VFX of making that, that general assembly hall work. But we had this opportunity where on, on uh, act, I think it's four of that episode, uh, maybe it's act five, where it just said red gives a UN speech. And, and John and I just laughed about it and thought, oh, my God, what would he do? Like, you know, it's like standing in front of the mirror giving your Oscar speech into a, into a hairbrush, you know, like, what would I mm-hmm. say? And what would Red say if he got an opportunity to speak to the U.N.? We knew the place would be empty. And, look, I wrote what I thought was a great version of it that uh, ultimately is not what's there. John wrote what he thought was a great version of it. And James started talking about Cary Grant and uh, LSD and sexuality. And uh, ultimately, I got to give credit to John. Uh, he and James sort of worked through it. Uh, but but it, uh, honestly, it's one of my favorite things of the show where you've got a procedural case of the week. You've got a bomb that's going to blow up. You've got the music that's the thriller stuff that's ticka, 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 you know, and it's all we got to race in and people in bulletproof vests and stuff and, 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 you know, SWAT teams. And in the middle of that, we just stop down for like three minutes to listen to Spader ramble about the effects of LSD opening his mind <laughs> and making him a more kind person. And, he, and he's got a really great point, a loving sort of, again, that weird morality um, it's a very warm speech. So yeah, I would give credit to John on that and James. Um, uh, but, uh, I loved watching it. It's funny and it's weird and it's, you're going, what am I watching? Yeah. Even I was like, what is happening? And then I, I loved it. You know, uh, by the time it was over, I was like, great. You know, we, we stopped the bomb and we got to hear Spader talk about drugs. You know, what could be better? And the icing is watching Dembe listen to the speech and just laugh at it. And you go, mm-hmm. that's probably just Hisham laughing at Spader doing this. Right. I think it probably is. Dembe's just like, oh, my God, really? Wait, I got this is what you would say to the UN? You know, he just wanders, you know, it just starts becoming this wandering speech. I thought it was fun. I'd probably do the same thing. So I, I can relate. <laughs> just start talking. It just starts coming out of your mouth and you're like, whatever. I just have this room and I want to enjoy it. I want to live. Right. We got a lot of plastic surgery talk too, th- this episode. A lot of plastic surgery talk. Yeah. Well, that's right. Did you find that challenging? Because we had Raleigh Sinclair just so recently in season five who kind of was the same thing. How did you guys have to work around that so that you know Raleigh's more of the alibi guy? This is really more of the plastic surgeon guy. Yeah, Raleigh Sinclair was more of a guy who, like you said, creates alibis and, and situations and doubles. He, I, I picture him more as a guy. He, he's more the, uh, you know, the guy in FX, you know, the old movie FX. Where oh, that's got a great movie. Plaster yep. masks and teeth, right? Yeah, Brian, Brian Dennehy, Den- come on. Brian Dennehy, great. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's a good movie. That was sort of the inspiration for that character. I think, um, uh, you know, this character of uh hans kohler and the sort of uh the facial reconstruction which uh, again is woven in uh, to, to the um you know to the series over the a number of years uh is is legitimately more about sort of a um changing appearances you know changing the way you look to disappear and it felt as blacklist worthy as any uh criminal and it felt like a good one to, you know, to open the season with, to sort of come back and say, look, let's just address this head on. The guy changed his face, you know, and this is the guy who did it, and this is the guy who has answers. And, of course, there's, there's an answer in there that, uh, that Reddington wants to 
hide and he succeeds in doing so. Which I think was great for that first hour because it felt very much like familiar. Fans will come back and they'll they'll watch this episode and go, oh yeah, it's you know he's got to get the guy because the guy has a thing and the thing's got something about him on it and you have to take the thing off the thing before you give it back to the FBI. It felt very blacklisted mm-hmm. before you move into season, episode two in the second hour and go, whoa, this is a whole new show now. This is something different. Yeah, the, the, it was conceived as a two-parter knowing that we were going to be on, again, it, knowing that we were going to be uh, two episodes in one night, we wanted it to feel like, wow, this should be, um, it's, like a, it's like a little 90-minute movie. You know, movies are now two hours, two and a half hours, which makes me crazy. But uh, mm-hmm. back in my day, movies were 90 minutes or 100 minutes. And, and it's, it's sort of a 90-minute movie, you know, where we start off with a presenting story about this doctor who changes faces. And along the way, we in, are introduced to uh, another character has a whole agenda of his own and um, and ultimately at the end of episode two gets away. Yeah, sort of two stories in one, but I think was was a fun sort of thematic romp in that territory of identity and facial reconstruction and becoming who, you know, somebody else. Uh, that's sort of a thematic note that uh, obviously knowing that red's not red, th- that we can play with a little more now and have some fun with. Can you tell, is the post office still a thing then? Or are we still, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens? The post office in terms of uh, the task force? Yeah, I mean, because Red is in jail. So it makes it hard to operate a Red Reddington task force. Yeah, well, it, the post office is definitely a thing, uh, mostly because it's our only real standing set. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, to produce the show, it's like, Guys, you don't shoot anything on our stages. You know, we, we weirdly have a, a set that, uh, you know, one, that one of our leads never or rarely goes on. And um, it makes it uh, a nightmare for New York. But, yeah, the post office and they're really they're, um, you know, again, they don't they don't know what Liz knows yet. And so there are stories coming where they're going to have to wrestle with either that or the information that Reddington has been captured or you know, how, how, you know, uh, how, how do they keep this afloat and cover it up? Uh, so yeah, that is uh, definitely still a place, both for story and practical purposes. That actually makes me, uh, I wanted to ask you this and I forgot to ask you this, the scene where they're seeing the Hollywood producer and whatnot, and they're actually on a movie set. Is that just blacklist set? <laughs> yeah, totally. That's what, I, that's what I thought. I just want to make sure. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, uh, again, that I got to give credit to that uh, with John. He, yeah. If you go back and watch that, he's talking, you know, the, uh, the, the producer is talking about how the studio's ripping them off and the agents are taking percentages. And I think, I think it was probably some therapy for John talking about, you know, <laughs> the Hollywood business and the way it works. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it, that was, uh, yeah, those are, we've rarely done that, but yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was actually, uh, on our, our, one of our two stages where, uh, they have a bunch of props and stuff. So it worked out well. So we, we, we knew that this was a, a different kind of thing because you guys are like writing in advance and you have a little bit of like runway that you can kind of go back and change some stories. When uh, we were kind of chatting about this episode early on, Rizzi Basha Moreau was going to be the name of the episode. So what was the cause that turns it into the Corsican? What is, what's the process that goes, like how do you choose, like what is it actually going to uh, finally be? Here's what I would say about that is that um, Basha Moreau, the the Corsican gets away and you may expect him to come back. And quite honestly, I, I, we found ourselves with a story where we've never done anything that's, you know, not, uh, you know, uh, that character or that character conclusion. And uh, honestly, I sort of struggled to think, well, what is this story really about? Is there, is there a different blacklister? And we reshuffled some of our, our titles to reflect um, a story that is upcoming because the, the Corsican or uh, Bastion Moreau, who we now know is his name, uh, may make another appearance at a, another date and time. Probably doesn't make any sense as I'm explaining it, but uh, that's, that's what that's all about. Well, it's like everybody was last season was like, where's the Ian Garvey conclusion episode? Why isn't Ian Garvey's conclusion? Where? So I, yeah, this is a, a way for you to say, hey, this is about what the Corsican is. That's the topic. And then later on, you could six, yeah. season seven, season eight. He doesn't, he we're not saying it's going to happen this season, but it could be that Basham Moreau shows up again somewhere down the line. Although I would bet it happens this season. It uh, might as well. Yeah, it, it, look, it, we, do, uh, we do find ourselves occasionally sort of 
in these more serialized storylines trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, who is it, it? It's sort of not a black, you know, it's not a blacklister of the week case. We've done it also in ruin or, uh, you know, Kate may, um, or the Mr. Kaplan episode, you know, where it's sort of an off brand sort of episode. And so, um, that's what that's about. Yeah. We, uh, we, we, we got caught and we realized, Oh wait, we have a little time to adjust this. So let's be a little more authentic to who the story is about and what it's about and, and adjust the titles. But there's no big conspiracy there. I wish I could tell you there was a big, a big mystery. What you do is you have him come back and then you have Clancy Brown guest star as the Kurgan and they can, Ooh, come, I like the Kurgan. <laughs> they can come to head because there can only be one and you can have that fight right there on the blacklist since you already got the Highlander. You know what? Come on. He, I think Christopher Lambert was great. He was. He is so spooky. His voice with the accent, and, and it's just, he's, it's so unusual. I just loved it. I thought he was great. He, he's one of those actors I always followed in the 80s and 90s, and then he kind of just went away for a little bit. I'm glad to see him. I'm glad to see him in something. I haven't seen him in a while. Good to have him back, yeah. And he was a fan of the show. What's cool about it is uh, I, we, I had, um, we had reached out to him, and it was one of those cool things where, he knew the show and he'd seen all the episodes and he was like, Oh my God, this would be great. You know? So it was, it's, it's fun to have somebody not, you know, sort of just doing a job, but coming in and being part of the, you know, being a fan too was, was really cool. That's awesome. Well, I know we got to let you go. Thank you so much for, for doing this, for popping by yet again. Appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Guys. I am grateful for you, uh, to you for uh, following the show so closely. It makes me paranoid sometimes and double check my math and arithmetic to go, wait a minute, does this all add up? But uh, I think we've been playing fair so far. And I, again, I'm, I, I, I love the way you guys handle your podcast and the interaction with your fans. And thank you for, uh, for doing it. It's, it's always a pleasure to come and chat with you guys. All right, Troy, we are done. We are done with the premiere for season six. We've been doing this a long time. You've done it one year longer than me, but we've both been doing this a hell of a long time. Are you still are you still jazzed for the blacklist? I'm absolutely jazzed for the blacklist. I'm even more jazzed that it's over 18 weeks instead of nine months because I just eat blacklist all the time. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and it was just get through it. Just get through it. Well, and the break was lot. really good because it allowed some people to go back and catch up on sh- episodes that they wanted to rewatch or, Hey, I, now that I have this big answer, like what do I want to go back and like kind of graze over again? So that they gave us some time to do that, I think, which kind of prepared for season six and gets people excited about the show. And it gave people that weren't caught up on season five, a chance to get through season five on Netflix before the season started. So I think we're going to have a lot more new people watching live this year. And I think that is the number one thing we have to tell people. If you know someone that watches the blacklist, the big thing is watch live. Friday nights are a real, real tough spot for TV fans. So make sure that if you have the opportunity, watch live on Friday nights. We need to keep the ratings up to make sure season seven exists. And then if you want to DVR it also, that also helps the kicker. So it's a twofer. For some reason, they don't they don't know how to count at Nielsen. They just count them both. So do both. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm really excited. This is going to be a very cool season. And I think it's going to go crazy places. I don't know where, but I think it's going to be pretty fun. Well, that will conclude this episode. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at the Blacklist GSM, where we will live tweet during the East Coast feed when possible. And we use the show's hashtag, The Blacklist. Don't forget to follow us on Tumblr, Instagram, and join the Facebook group. Just search for The Blacklist Exposed over there and talk about the show, the podcast, or what you did during the long hiatus. And one thing we should probably point out, because this is now airing on Fridays, and obviously that makes it a little trickier to record it won't always be Sunday or, or it might be Monday morning before you get the show. So don't ever freak out if it comes, you know, it's the weekend. Things get crazy. You never know what's going to happen, right? That's right. All right. You can also subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and now Pandora or from your favorite podcast player of choice. You can even listen from the website, plus find all the intel and analysis about this episode for the season six premiere by visiting theblacklessexposed.com. Big thanks for listening. Don't forget to answer our profiling question. Will Jennifer survive season six? Thanks so much, guys. We will see you again next week. Take care. 
Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie, right? We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.